Cascadia, uh, for those of you who don't know, this is our sixth season. Uh, we, in the five years uh, since the first festival in 2017, we have shown the work of 125 women filmmakers. And, and this year we're showing another 33 women directors, so that brings us to around 150. Um, this evening, I'd like to, uh, before we get started, uh, you saw all the sponsors on our overhead here. Um, this festival, of course, would not be possible without uh, all of those people. And I would uh, particularly like to uh, thank our sponsors, the city of Bellingham, uh, Whatcom County, and our major uh, media sponsor, KCTS and Crosscut. So let's give them a little bit of a round of applause. Also, our sponsors for this evening, uh, we had a reception with uh, Martha Coolidge uh, earlier at the Art Museum, and that was sponsored by uh, Patty and Frank Imhoff, and Audrey Sager and Steve Gellerman. <laughs> our conversation this evening is being sponsored by the Women of Maury Avenue, which is a book club that has been with us since the very beginning. How about that? And then, uh, our film sponsor this evening is Anne Hildebrand. So, uh, yeah. uh, I do want to thank uh, a couple of other people. Uh, tonight's event was largely uh, the undertaking of uh, our advisory board member, Valerie Delena. Yay. Oh, are you here? Yay. Uh, Valerie. Yay. I bet she's still at the museum closing up. So, uh, she did a, she's been doing a wonderful job. Um, I also would like to just uh, recognize um, the Cascadia board because uh, they're a very hardworking board and without those people uh, this would not be happening either. So if you're on the board, could you raise your hand at least, please? And, right and also um, all of our hardworking volunteers and staff, uh, as I told somebody, it takes about 100 people to put this festival on, including our, our directors and our, our staff people and uh, our home hosts our volunteers, and otherwise uh, this would not be happening. So uh, thank you to all of you people for having us. Uh, I, am, I am thrilled tonight uh, for our uh, 2022 honored guest. Uh, we've had some terrific honored guests since we started that program in 2017, 18. Uh, we didn't do it for a couple of years during the pandemic when we were all online. But uh, this year it was kind of a, and I won't say a no-brainer exactly, but uh, this this uh, individual is somebody that deserves our attention and, and, and gratitude um, beyond what I can say this evening. Um, Martha Coolidge is one of the most illustrious women directors working in the film industry today. She has 52 or so credits, uh, directing credits to her name. She was the first president of a woman president of the Directors Guild of America, which is the powerful union to which all uh, film directors uh, belong. And uh, for her service, uh, extraordinary service, she received uh, that prestigious uh, Rod Robert Aldrich Jr. Uh, award in recognition of all the work she has done. She is known uh, throughout the industry as a fierce advocate for uh, women in the film industry, uh, has been devoting a lot of her uh, life career to that, and, and for that we, we are grateful, and it's one reason that uh, we are recognizing her tonight for all the work that she has done, in addition to her uh, lengthy career and outstanding career. Uh, she is known uh, as uh, an actor's director. She has worked with some of the best talents in the business, including people like Laura Dern, um, Oh, he's damn sorry, I forget about Nicholas Cage, <laughs> Gina Davis, uh, Robert Duvall, Halle Berry, and a whole lot of others that's just too long to mention. Um, anyway, tonight she'll be talking about her career, her work, uh, and um, the challenges that uh, she has faced in her own career as, as a woman director as she has risen up the ladder to prominence in, in the very tough film business. Um, she'll be talking this evening with our uh, new program director, Claudia Puig, who is here from Los Angeles, who Claudia is uh, also uh, president of the Los Angeles Film Critics Association. She has a talk show, a film talk show on NPR and a lot of other things. But uh, we're really, really happy to have both of them here for us. So please, would you give a warm welcome to Martha Coolidge and Claudia Puig.
Hot girls in water. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> not vodka. Yeah. <laughs> um, this is such a Oh, do we have to turn these on? Okay, there we go. That's better, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, she also has some of the stuff I was going to say. But, <laughs> oh, um, it's, some of the awards you have, uh, you're, you're amazing in having discovered Nicholas Cage and Val Kilmer and your film has your films have won Emmy nominations and IFP awards and of course you were the VGA president. You have a career that has spanned over 40 years, which is amazing. And you've paved the way for so many other women. You were the first DGA president, female DGA president, and now we have another one. Yes, there's so, a second. Yes, mm -hmm. so that's great. It was, and it was a few years before a second came along. Just a few, yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> So you've opened the door for women directors in Hollywood. I, I feel like you know you. Well, I think the other women opened the door too. So it was we. There have been women around. Well, you in terms of big budgets and rising stars. Yeah. And that you know that I feel like you you started something. It's growing. But how do you look at the landscape now? <laughs> well, this is a, a peculiar thing to say. I don't want to sound grumpy. Uh, <laughs> but um, it, it, it's not very different, uh, except that there are women being hired. And there are many women who gained experience and are gaining experience all the time. And one of the biggest problems for women getting into the business was not having experience. So we've beaten a big, a big number there of people who just didn't have enough experience to get hired. But it is it is not that different. So it's good. I, I mean, it's better. There's definitely people being uh, honored, and there's definitely people being hired and working on various shows. But there's still shows that have never hired a woman and probably never will. But uh, it it is. Uh, it, it isn't that it's easy, right? But this isn't an easy business. So some strides have been made, but there's still a very long way. To go. Yeah, there is, and and it's not an easy business, right? For anybody. Yeah, for anybody. So I was really intrigued when I was looking at your biography. Uh, let's go back to the beginning when you first decided to become a filmmaker. You were going to RISD, right? The Rhode Island, right? Right. Right. So what? And they didn't have a filmmaking. No, but RISD, being an art school, uh, had teachers who were very swept up in film and the cameras and all of that. So what they did is, in the beginning uh, of this sort of Bauhaus structure, in the first year, you do a, everything, basically. You do learn a lot about everything, including binding books and things like that. So. Uh, we did a thing called two-dimensional design, and then we did three-dimensional design. And what they did is, oh, uh, they're just professors who wanted us to work with cameras and building three-dimensional things, and and then um, basically doing the paper montages, but but actually making it move. So we did a lot of film, and they were really swept up in it, and that. That, that just increased our interest in it, and people wanted to go into film. So what I did is I took them seriously. Somebody had mentioned that if you had a good enough grade, you could get uh, an independent study program and then study what you wanted. So I went to them and said, well, okay, I want to be a film major, and I want to take my independent study and put it into film. And I bought a camera, and then um, I had a proposal for a film to make, and it was, it, I did it, I sold them to, on it, and I went and cast this film and shot it and did all that, but it was kind of lonely because I was n not in a class. But aside from that, it was fun, and I'd get fellow students to crew it. Was it a full feature, or was it a short? I, it was a short, but it was, I can't remember the exact length, but it wasn't, it was like 
I don't know. I, I wish I could tell you right now, but <laughs> it's been a long time. I have a copy of the film. And uh, it was a very, it was the story of Demeter and Persephone. <laughs> and so, so it, it was, uh, they were cast, and then what happens is Persephone is, is raped and stolen and kidnapped by uh, Hades, or whatever, taken to the underworld. So Demeter goes after her and then disguises herself as an old lady and, you know, kind of whispers in her ear and stuff. But when Demeter escapes, when Persephone escapes from the underworld, it gives birth to everything on earth and all the plants uh, grow and buds are coming up. And so I, I somehow rented all these biological films because I love biology. So I, and I copied all these plants growing. I mean, I filmed some of these sequences and cut it together with footage I shot. And so when she was freed from Hades, all these plants go up. It was a pretty crazy film. But it was good. And somebody, I don't know, somebody saw it and thought that I would have done sort of a Christ movie. That was very interesting, <laughs> um, especially considering it's based on older than Greek. Astrology, <laughs> but okay, and uh, it was really, it was good, and I decided to leave RISD and, and then try to make films, excuse me, make films in New York. And you, then you made documentaries in New York, right? I did, I made documentaries in New York, I worked in commercials, mm -hmm. uh, I attended Columbia, mm -hmm. which was disappointing only because mm -hmm. I was excited, there I was in Columbia, graduate school, and, uh, but they shut down because of the student strikes, and so we were going to free classes where our professors were doing things in their living rooms where we would go and we'd discuss education, and uh, that was interesting, but not quite what we were interested, and then, um, but I applied to film school for graduate school at NYU, and I was interviewed by uh, Mr. Scorsese's favorite professor. Wow. And he had said to me, and how long have you wanted to be a director? And I was trying to talk to him. I said, what, what makes you think you can be a director? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I tried to explain that I knew I was a storyteller and a director. I'd been one all my life. <laughs> And, uh, but he didn't seem to think that sold him. He'd say, yeah, but there are no women directors. <laughs> and I just looked at him. It never occurred to me to think I could be a director because there weren't any. That, to me, I don't know. How, what kind of sense? How we were raised to think we could do anything we wanted, right? And uh, so I just said, no, I, but anyway. And what do you know? NYU accepted me as a film. I, I didn't know, and they had our my class was almost fifty percent women. Wow. So it was interesting, and I went there, and it was a great school, uh, uh, great kids, great people, some people from all over the world, and uh, I I loved it and went there, but it was two years. And then um, I started at the very, I got the idea to do my film, Not a Pretty Picture, while I was finishing up. So you also studied with Lee Strasberg and Stella Adler. I did, that was later, oh, when okay. I came to LA. Oh. I came to LA and I was, I was at Zoetrope, and that's only because when I was in New York, uh, I got a call from Fred Roos, who was Francis Coppola's producer, and he said they wanted to meet, but he didn't tell me it was Francis. He, he said, we want, I want to meet you and uh, coming to New York, we're going to be at the Sherry Netherland, blah, blah, blah. And I was cutting Not a Pretty Picture. So they called and I went. And I went in and I went up to the suite, which I guess Francis always rented or it was like his suite. It was like, I think, the whole floor. 
and uh, when I met Fred, talked to him, and then Francis came in. Mm -hmm. And that was interesting. And then they said, why don't you come to the movies with us? So I went with them, and we're walking down the street, and Francis, I tripped. <laughs> I tripped. And he said, oh my god, you tripped. You're a director, and you tripped. You can't do that. <laughs> and then he tripped. <laughs> and he said, yes, and she just, no, he didn't. And he, very funny. It was all very funny. So we went to see Casper Hauser, and uh, and then we also passed. I'll never forget this. Uh, Colonel Sanders was getting out of a car, <laughs> dressed like Colonel Sanders, <laughs> and Francis goes running around. Oh my God! It's Colonel Sanders. <laughs> And uh, so, anyway, I, he, they said, keep in touch, keep in touch, because we have to go back to the Philippines and finish shooting Apocalypse Now. So I finished cutting, you know, not Prefecture, and then it was going to open, and I then was invited to come out to the West Coast to show it, and I did call them, and I did get together with them in San Francisco, and, and Francis said, so what have you learned? And I said, well, I, I think... I said, I think we never have enough money. <laughs> and he said, really? You know that already? <laughs> and uh, it was great. And then I came down to LA and stuff and met some people when my film was showing. Uh, so it was, it was good. And then they sort of went through a whole thing, finishing that movie. And in the end, I was brought aboard uh, it, um, Zoetrope to do a film for Francis. That was which, his studio. Yeah, it was his studio, and I didn't ever make the film, but I did spend two long years making it, quote unquote, not making it. But and it was uh, really interesting. I learned a lot and met a lot of people and cast two different movies with Fred Roos producing for me, but I didn't get to shoot the films, and then. So a trope sort of went belly up, and that was a very interesting time. Uh, and it, I took the opportunity of being unemployed to study everything I could about acting, production, anything. I it was uh, it was great, and that was my life. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think that studying acting has made given you a real because you have a real eye for talent? Obviously, you discovered Nicholas Cage, Val Kilmer. You had a big hand in Rashida Jones's career, Holly Berry's career, James Gandolfini's yes, career. Yes, James Gandolfini. Yes, I mean these are all amazing yeah. actors who went on to amazing, do even more amazing work. So you must have you have something. What do you think it came from? Well, here's what I felt. Um, I did act. I liked acting. I was good at it, uh, and I was very good at spotting people who could act. Uh, however, I had a lot of hang-ups about it. So, uh, well, most about people. Doing the doing acting, but when I started directing, I was really happy. And, um, but I do think that there are people who see it, see talent right away, and then I think there are other people who work very hard to see it. But that's okay, it doesn't make any difference. And uh, Fred Roos was probably, at least legendarily, the greatest casting person Hollywood's ever seen. So I got a lot of experience casting two different movies with him and looking at people and comparing notes and stuff like that. So, and I did learn that I have an eye for things and he has an eye and they're slightly different. So when we cast this new film that you can see tonight, it, it was, he loved one guy and I went with him because I think he has really great taste. And sometimes I've learned, you know, if I see something, stick by it, you know. Trust yourself. Trust yourself, do it, and, and trust the actor. That's the most important thing. You've got to trust the actor and let the actor own the part, which is very important. Doesn't mean you can't correct them if things are getting too complicated or weird. It just means that you don't micromanage them. I've heard the director say that we hire a good actor and get out of the way. Get out of the way and don't micromanage.
And I'd say that's true of everybody. Yeah. But you can easily hire a person. I mean, acting is another thing, but even a camera person or anybody, and and you can sort of lose faith in them, mm -hmm. and then you micromanage them. But that you're not really a sound person. You know, you're not really a camera, a cinematographer. So it's there it has to be another way to encourage them, uh, and 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 give them a pep talk without trying to pretend you could do it better. Well, it's, it's interesting because with the exception of the film that we're about to see, I'll find you, which you made, what? Well, I started in 15, yeah. Um, and mm -hmm. you've been working a lot of TVs? I did, uh, after a certain point, did work some in TV because there really, nobody was making the kind of features that I was making. And, uh, and also there really was a great opportunity in television, as long as you got a good job, that you could change genres yes. and do things you'd never done before. Yeah. And I really enjoyed that. And it seems, I've heard people say that it's a little more open to women. Is that true? Um, well, Here's the problem. I was the chair of the Creative Rights Committee, so I heard everything. Uh, I heard all the problems everybody was having, so I don't know. I, that's not from the way I heard it, but there are more people hired, so there's more room for women. I, maybe I've heard it more about acting. Like as women age, you you can see them on TV, whereas in movies, a little less. Well, I suppose, but you know what? It isn't like they just make more parts for women. They don't. That now it's getting a little more like pressure is being put on the studios and the, the corporations to hire more women so and more ethnic people and it, it is just odd that it wasn't opening up opening up the way it should have yeah it makes, so it's streaming and all the other possibilities i know you worked really on, on an online show um yes i did i i took a job doing a uh what they call a uh what is that called uh, without thinking of the word, I'll try. It, it, no, it was a show where each show, each one of the episodes, is a different story. Mm -hmm. So these were like little horror. It's an anthology. Yeah, it's an anthology show. <laughs> so that means that each one of them costs more money. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I feel like there's a, more opportunities, I guess, in the kinds of shows that are I don't think so. Yeah. I just think that the women, like everybody else, are coming from now, and we learn things that are now. And it just is was an, a, a somewhat absurd prejudice that made certain people think that women didn't know about that. And yet women started out in the early days of the film industry. Right away, at the beginning. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And as some people say, this, as soon as money got into the picture, the men came in. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's the way. <laughs> well, I was looking at some statistics because of the 250 top grossing films of 2021, only 17% were directed by women, and that, and, and then it, it actually had gone down, went down after that instead of going up. Well, and it's been down since I got in. But it just has, as I said, it just didn't get better, like, noticeably. But I hope it's better now. And then there's, for, you know, there's the women of color. Which is well, that is good, because that is a little better. Because what happens is they started giving credits to the studios and the networks who hired ethnic people and women. And so then it's better if they take an ethnic woman and get two points. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, you know, so you get that. It, so it's been rough on everybody. This, you know, one person wins, one person loses, sort of. But it's good. There have been more women uh, directing, and that's good. So in terms of the DGA and, and being the first woman president back in 2002, 2003. Yes. So what has the DGA done, if anything? To improve the situation. Well, I think actually, I think the DGA has been terrific. The DGA is, at, of all the unions, the most sort of put together and has put a lot of very smart lawyers into the thinking cap of how to develop themselves and 
push for ethnic, ethnically diverse people and women into the workplace. And it's sort of been working. They, they, they had to try one thing, try another. They tried a case uh, against, I think, Warner Brothers. I don't know. Anyway, it didn't work out because apparently there's some thing in the law, there must be some legal people here, about cases where the members of the organization were not primarily the uh, prejudiced against party, meaning it wasn't an all-woman organization. So anyway, they threw the case out. So, uh, and the lawyers I knew said, and the judges said, yeah, that's right, which seems unfair. But anyway, uh, but I think what's happened is that they started doing this thing where they really put the networks on notice. They weren't getting the scripts in time. So directors would be taking a job, prepping for two weeks or something, and they wouldn't have a script. <laughs> and then the day before shooting, is a, you sum up or all of the script would arrive, which Really, that's a, not very good for prep. And uh, so they put them on notice and they said it would get worse because if you continue this behavior, we're going to have to correct it and then we'll put it in our contract and this and that. And so it's, it's, it heated up and it did improve people getting the script and that pressure on those networks also made them improve who they hire. And so there's been a change and it's been good, but it's, it's been real. And that's a great thing. And it's changed the membership in the guild. It's, we have our second woman president now. Uh, so it's, it's very slow, it seems. Mm -hmm. But these are organizations, and they don't have to slowly. They do. They move slowly. And it really is noticeable in the guild how it is. And I think women feel more comfortable. And I remember when I was elected, I got huge screams and cries from all these people who, you know, dreadlocks down to here and all kinds of people saying, oh, thank God, thank God, you know. And the men who'd been running the guild for a long time looked over and was like, what's happening? What, what's happening? <laughs> so, but it was, it was great. And I think it really has changed things. And it's, you know, incrementally. Yes. So we were you were talking about the prep and everything there. That made me remind me of a conversation we were having backstage there about when you made Alpine View. Yes. Um, in Poland. And yes. Can you tell people a little bit about that process? Because it sounds like it was a bit time consuming. Well, the problem with it was, uh, it's it's it was this film that you're going to see was financed by an individual who had promised his father on his father's deathbed that he would make a movie about Poland. And that meant about his father's time in Poland during World War II. And so I went out there, and he kept saying, we've hired everybody, we've got all the locations, you come. And what had happened, they hired a director. But that director quit. And uh, I didn't know all the ins and outs of why I quit, but I found out. And um, so this guy really didn't know anything about filmmaking. So when he says he hired people, he hadn't hired anybody. He told people they were going to work on the film. But he hadn't set it up. He hadn't contracts. It wasn't like, well, which is probably good, because it's, you know you usually go with your tastes, not somebody else's. And uh, it was uh, an adventure. But it made it slow. <laughs> because you had to kind of educate people as you went along. And I mean, not just me, every member of the crew. But we did get this fantastic crew. It was great. The people in Poland were great. Uh, they don't have every skill. So we brought prop people in from, from England. We had drivers from other countries. Uh, we had to go get wardrobe in England and France. And you know, so you just had to go seek out things in the places that they were. Uh, it isn't like they had a lot of rental houses in Poland. <laughs> but it was uh, an adventure. And they were closed up, stripped down uh, palaces that uh, were just incredible. And so we went and pieced together all these different palaces. And 
put them together, dress them up, and put them in the movie. And uh, it was it was an adventure. The only thing that happened in both cases were you have actors from all over the world. We hired actors from everywhere, except America. There are very few Americans in the movie. But then, when you go to do your sound at the end, you're doing what they call looping. I don't know if everybody here knows what that is, but that's when, if you had, say, a, suddenly a drill started, and you can't hear what the actor's saying, now the actor comes back, says those words, acting the part, and fits them into their own lips because they have the same kind they of rhythm. They do the little recording too. Yeah, and they record it, and then they put it into the movie in the mix. Mm -hmm. And what happened with uh, uh, both films is it went over $100,000 in looping, which is a lot of looping. <laughs> and, um, you know, it, it worked out, but it's a lot of money and a lot of time. The other thing was, I, it's never happened to me before. In the United States, there's never been a problem with syncing sound. I've shot with live sound and live music, or pre-recorded and live music, uh, all my life. And we go to Poland, and they do it, and I have recording studios, and we're pre-recording music, and then playing it back on set, but adding voices or adding instruments, and then it's bringing it back, and then at the end, adding in more instruments. And Well, all of the music was out of sync, all of it, all of it. That's really a disaster. Uh, it wasn't like a disaster, meaning it could it had to be thrown away. It wasn't quite that. But we had to sync all that instrumental, orchestral, and vocal sound by hand. Wow. And that means adding a frame here, you know, oh God, it was unbelievable. So it took months. And um, that was slow, but we did it. Uh, so it is all in sync. Um, it's just incredible that we could have that disaster happen and recover. That's how the business is. It wouldn't have necessarily worked before. Well, we're going to see the fruit of your fruits of your labors here and uh, take an adventure with you. Yes. Um, and I want to thank you. Oh, the thank you, Martha Coolidge. Thank you. Thank you.